Hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, webinar, Open Dialogue, organized by the Stop Gap Dance Company and commissioned by Arts Council England, the Italian Ministry of Culture, Department of Performing Arts, the Italian Cultural Institute in London, and the British Council. My name is uh, Dalila D'Amico, she, her, I have dark and short hair and I wear a black top. I am a researcher in performing arts and accessibility. I'm a member of the Italian Association Aldiqua Artists and I'm curator of the residency Creazioni Accessibili produced by Orbita Spellbound National Center for Dance Production. Before we start, I will tell you uh, a bit about the organization of the webinar and how it works. Indeed, since it is Zoom webinar, it works in a slightly different way. You won't be able to use your camera or microphone. We will be recording the session and you can uh, then watch it on YouTube on the Stop Gap Dance Company uh, channel. We have Claudia, our interpreter tonight, who will uh, translate simultaneously into Italian and English. And uh, to hear the English translation, you can select the interpretation icon, which is a small globe uh, below uh, on the screen, and then you select your language. English, Italian. So if you want to uh, hear Italian translation, uh, select the uh, interpretation icon and uh, select Italian. And you also have the original uh, audio. We also have British and Italian sign language interpretation tonight with Michael, Sonia and Antonella. And uh, they uh, will uh, translate into, as I said, both British and Italian sign language. You can uh, click on the interpretation icon and the corresponding interpreter will appear. The interpreter should remain on your screen, but you can also pin an interpreter by clicking on the three dots that appear as you hover over their video and you click pin. And this will, again, fix the interpreter on screen. We also have live captions in both uh, Italian and English. You uh, simply select the CC button, uh, uh, show closed captions at the bottom of the screen and you can activate them. English, uh, English captions are available via the link that Monique posted in the chat, or she will shortly do so. And uh, we included the link also in uh, the email and on the website of the event. Of course, you can interact with us. You can ask questions. They are welcome, of course. In order to ask questions, you click on the Q&A button, which makes it possible for you to write questions to us. And we will take them questions at the end. So we really invite you to participate in the conversation and also use the hashtag open dialogo and tagging uh, at stop gap dance uh, and uh, so we will be on social media as well today's webinar is uh, dedicated to creative access uh, for uh, dance audiences and connects two organizations working in italy and england in this field Giuseppe Comuniello, Camilla Guarino, and Diana Dal Selmo of Aldiqua Artists, the first professional uh, association of artists with disabilities in Italy, and Stop Gap Dance Company, uh, represented today by Access Artist Lily Norton. The webinar will introduce uh, various ways in which these two organizations ex experiment with creative accessibility strategies in dance. In France, dance more 
more than other disciplines, such as movies, theater, presents a stimulating but also problematic challenge with respect to accessibility because it does not have a plot, a dialogue or characters useful for naming the performance on stage. So how can we make uh, a performance accessible? We will talk about this during the hour together. And before going to the core matter, I would like to ask participants uh, to introduce uh, themselves. Uh, Lily Norton is uh, the first uh, speaker whom I invite uh, to take the floor. Lily, you have the floor. Hello, um, good evening. Uh, I'm Lily Norton. My pronouns are they, them. Um, I'm a, a white person in my mid twenties. I have curly brown hair, which is up in a bun and I have a fringe. Uh, I've got multiple face piercings and lots of tattoos. Um, and I'm wearing yellow dungarees with a black top. Um, and I have a white wall behind me. Um, I'm a neurodivergent person. I am autistic. Uh, I might move around quite a lot and I'm going to try speak slowly this evening. Um, I am a dance artist, dance teacher and a writer with a specialism slash special interest in integrated accessibility and audio description for dance. Um, and I'm Stopgaps content and access artist, which um, encompasses a few different areas. Um, so I support the company's communications and marketing, creating a lot of content for our social media channels and designing graphic resources and elements for various projects. Then as Stopgaps Access Artist, I collaborate with fellow artists and staff across artistic, educational and communications outputs to ensure that as a company, we are realizing our vision of accessible and inclusive arts. Um, so day to day, this includes things like creating information and content in multiple formats, such as audio blogs or easy read guides. Um, and then longer term, it sees me supporting uh, artistic work and embedding accessibility throughout our projects and productions to ensure deaf, disabled and neurodivergent audiences are considered and included. Um, most recently, it finds me collaborating with co-artistic director of Stopgap, Lucy Bennett, and the creative team as part of our latest production, which is called Lived Fiction. Um, so for that, I'm developing integrated audio description for the work, um, developing surrounding access and resources for the production and also providing insights from my lived experience as an autistic person with access needs. Um, so as a company, Stopgap have been breaking down barriers to accessing dance for disabled people and providing equitable training pathways alongside developing inclusive choreographic approaches. But I feel very passionately that creating work with deaf, disabled and neurodivergent artists is only just sort of one part of the equation as an inclusive company. Um, so ensuring that our audience also reflects the diversity of our artists is of equal importance. Um, and to do this, we need to identify the variety of barriers people experience as contemporary dance audiences um, and seek to address them equitably. Um, and one of the key ways we are doing this is through integrating access into our artistic outputs. Um, so our explorations into more creative approaches to access really began with a project called Dance Tapes, um, working with four international disabled artists to explore how we could present and choreograph dance through speech and sound using audio description as a starting point for the artists to create intimate audio experiences. Um, and you can listen to these on Stopgap's website. Um, and these uh, explorations into creative access continued within digital work and also working sort of retroactively on previously made work. Um, and now in our upcoming production, which um, incorporates creative audio description, captioning and sensory considerations for neurodivergent audiences. Um, and I think working to remove barriers to enable participation is, is vital for many deaf, disabled, neurodivergent people. But when access is allowed to creatively influence work 
by being integrated and thought about right from the beginning of a process. Um, it's beneficial to everyone and enhances everyone's experience alongside making it more accessible. Um, and the artistic potential, I think, is, is enormous, especially in dance. Um, integrated access in theatre is really well established, but for us at Stopgap, we're really excited about exploring creative access for dance. And I believe um, access is a collective responsibility too. Um, and I feel that it should be sort of understood as an act of care and love rather than a burden or an afterthought. Um, so it's exciting to be here today to explore with other artists. And yeah, I really enjoy encouraging people to incorporate access into their practices and everyday lives. Um, and I'm fascinated by the creativity and innovation that occurs from working inclusively. Um, yeah, that's me. Thank you. And now we will uh, give the floor remotely to Diana Anselmo, who makes accessible performances for the deaf community. And she is not with us, but she sent a video to us, which we will now watch together. Hi, my name is Diana, Diana Anselmo. I'm an artist, performer and activist. And I'm a member of Altiqua Artists. I'm making this video with the aim of talking about the accessibility of deaf audiences in the case of a danced performance. Before we begin, let me specify that the dance I'm referring to here it's dance that involves the body without any use of sign language or its elements, therefore the dance of the hearing. That said, let's go back to the accessibility of the deaf audience. It is commonly thought that making dance accessible is very easy. Nobody speaks, there is no spoken language, and therefore everything is accessible without exception to a deaf audience. Work done. Well, I mean, it is true that dance lets itself better to accessibility because it contains no text to translate, but it is also true that something accessible is not automatically suitable. Deaf and hearing people have different ways of experiencing aesthetics. If in both cases we look at the dance uh, uh, and, and, and there is no presence of language, we cannot forget the dramaturgic role that music often plays. The input is uh, twofold. And for the hearing person, it travels through both a visual and auditory channel. Music adds layers of further meaning and conveys the aesthetic experience. The deaf, on the other hand, only makes use of the visual channel. This is a significant difference. It, it, and uh, I would like and uh, make uh, examples. If dance is slow, it is made of uh, uh, slow uh, movements uh, and uh, the hearing audience uh, can be supported by the music while deaf audience is left with very few visual elements to make the experience sustainable. So it is accessible, but is it also suitable? If we compare a performance of one single dancer with one of 10, Hearing people can, out of personal taste, choose the choreographic composition they prefer, while deaf people are bound to find the one with more people on stage more attractive because it automatically carries more visual elements, that is rhythm, movement, synchronicity, that can enrich the aesthetic experience. The fact that deaf perception does not use the music channel should not be seen as a punishment or the eternal impossibility to fully enjoy the artistic product. It is not so. It is just that our aesthetic experience makes use of a different channel, the visual one, which has full dignity, validity and autonomy. Of course, it is important that the content of the performance resonates with the necessary characteristics. Uh, 
uh, slowness versus speed, the number of dancers, but there's also the presence of stage design, costumes and colors versus a bare and achromatic sense scene, as well as the prolonged presence of movements of darkness. And in my work, I also collaborate with dance festivals to select uh, the most uh, suitable performances in their program to be offered to deaf audiences. To do this, I need uh, to watch the video trailers of the shows so as to evaluate all elements. Who uh, can do so? Only a, a deaf person. So I would uh, urge festivals to ask a deaf person directly, even better if an artist, which of their shows and performances are more suitable, which are easier, which are more difficult by virtue of the specificity of deaf culture. I would like to add that in the past few years, together with the Italian Festival Oriente Occidente, we experimented the technology of subpacks, which are vibrating backpacks that move in, accord, in line with the music. They are certainly an interesting device, but it would be wrong to delegate to them the entire success of the performance or consider them the solution. One must always start with uh, and from how well a performance adheres to the canons of the deaf culture and experience to visual perception, and then indeed subpacks can be a good addition. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Diana, for sending the video. And uh, now I would like to give the floor to uh, Giuseppe uh, Comuniello and then Camilla Guarino, who will tell us about poetic audio description. You have the floor. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Giuseppe Comuniello. My pronoun is he, him. I'm white with uh, dark hair, brown eyes and a big nose. First of all, let me say that with Camilla, we belong to Aldiqua Artists, a professional organization of disabled artists in Italy. And in this capacity, we tend to bring accessibility fully into a live performance. We do not have a company, one company, one festival. We are independent from that viewpoint, but we try and collaborate as much as possible to make uh, sure that people understand how important accessibility is within festivals or uh, in theater programs. With Camilla, our work consists uh, in uh, creating poetic audio descriptions. We call them poetic. Uh, because they are different from the traditional ones. And we will try and explain what that means. Uh, we uh, started with our own experience. I'm bland, blind, so I started with my own experience. And when uh, going to the theater, I always tried uh, to uh, use uh, the help of uh, Camilla to understand. And uh, of course, uh, we couldn't speak that much during performances because otherwise we would be annoying others. And uh, so we also used the gestures. For instance, we would use the palm of the hand as if it were the scene. And uh, she would put the fingers on the hand to show where performers were on stage. So we created all the descriptions starting from that. We liked it so much and others uh, also uh, enjoyed it so much in Florence and elsewhere that we started making poetic descriptions for several festivals uh, at this moment and also for two theatre programmes in Florence and in Piemonte, Piedmont, uh, northwest of Italy. Now Camilla will have the floor and she will tell us what a poetic audio description is and what we mean by it. Good evening. My name is Camilla. I am a she. I have uh, short brown hair 
and I'm wearing a black blouse and there is a musical instrument behind me. I'm a dancer, a performer, and I'm also an author for the theatre, and I have been working with Giuseppe and Altiqua artists for some years now in the creation of poetic descriptions. It is so because they are not objective descriptions of the uh, performance, because we uh, do poetic descriptions uh, for dance, and we think that being objective in art is impossible, and that applies even more to contemporary dance and dance in general. So our choice was that of uh, taking our subjective vision of the performance to be audio described, talk about it with the artist who created the, the performance and with the performers and find or strike a sort of compromise, if I may say so, in order not to exceed in terms of the poetic input of the artist. We don't want to give too much our own subjective view, nor should we only stick to what comes out of the performance. There is always, you see, a difference between what an artist would like to convey and what the audience perceives. We are somewhere in between these two realities, these two situations. So we always start with a dialogue. We ask about the origin of the performance, uh, how performance are on stage, how they define themselves, and what readings were made by the artist while creating the performance, while devising the performance. So we try and understand everything which has brought there, and we try and give our vision and mix it with the poetics of the artist uh, to come as close as possible to the work of the artist. There are several ways uh, uh, you can see performers move at the same time on stage. There are endless ways. And you also base your what you see on your own experience, which means that you should choose based uh, on, on your experience, on our experience in this case, and the dialogue with the artist to establish which way we should go uh, to, in order to um, develop uh, our own work. You see, it happens uh, that improvisation uh, takes place also in contemporary dance. And so we uh, are there when performance rehearse in order to really absorb their rhythms, the movements they make, uh, or their flows of movements. So for each dancer, this is something we do so that we know what happens and we know what happens when they improvise. We realize that. Uh, for Giuseppe and myself, it is fundamental to work together. You see, Giuseppe cannot see the performance that is audio described. And so his presence is fundamental for me because I get the right rhythm to describe the scene. He tells me if I put too many words in, because uh, you see, uh, if you see a person walking, but you hear the steps, you don't need to write it in the description. So he tells me that I can hear the steps and I don't write those extra words, which would be in excess. So if this is a teamwork. Uh, Giuseppe and I work together. We can't do this uh, uh, individually. And we are also collaborating with other artists in order to try and make audio description something which is integral to artistic work whenever possible so that also um, sighted people can enjoy it. Why not? Thank you. Thank you, Camilla, and uh, thank you, Giuseppe. Thank you very much. I see that there are no questions uh, from the audience, not yet. So I would like to go back to Lily and ask her a question, because you told us already a lot about the work with Stop Gap. But I would like to ask uh, you what created access uh, 
means, uh, what it means to work with stopgap in that capacity as an access artist. So you have the floor, Lily, to answer this question. Thank you. Um, yes, so as someone who experiences barriers to attending dance performances, I can understand how isolating an inaccessible environment and production can feel. Um, yeah, so in my role, I'm considering how a variety of audiences might be accessing and encountering our work across digital and in-person platforms and considering then what approaches to accessibility we can take, whether it's integrating audio description, whether it's creative captioning, whether there's sign language interpretation, creating accessible information to support the work, and then trying to creatively integrate these approaches into the work too. So rather than leaving access as something that is thought about right at the end of a process when the choreography or the work is already made, um, it's thought about from the very beginning and it's collaborated on across everyone involved in a, in a project. Um, I mean, we know we're never going to get this perfect and this process is never going to be perfect. We're never going to make anything completely accessible to everyone we want to reach. Um, but for me, I think creative access is an opportunity um, and by sort of embedding and embracing accessibility in the artistic process. Um, it's an opportunity to develop your art form in, in new ways. Um, and I think it also transforms accessibility from being a service into this, into this artistic experience, which acknowledges and invites in audiences to experience work in, in new ways. Um, so yeah, to share about a little about uh, the role in my process in the in the new production so as access artist I've been part of the artistic process from in, initial conversations and ideas about the work and then provided sort of a sounding board for Lucy the choreographer and her ideas during the process um, and I think it's also balanced a lot with dramaturgy which is what um, Diana was mentioning um, and it's sort of about how things are composed dramatically and how things work with one another, sort of helping make sense of the work and how it comes across, both creatively and in terms of accessibility. Um, and in terms of a process, I really love collaborating with dancers and other creatives when thinking about access, and um, particularly when creating audio description. Um, I love sort of harnessing dancers in a sensory responses and perce perceptions from within the choreography and their movement, um, as it so, so often informs the most engaging and moving language for the description. And I really enjoyed um, what Camilla uh, was saying about sort of this balance between what the artist wants to convey and then what the audience receives and what they're understanding. Um, and I think a lot of my role is finding this balance about what we want the creative access to say and balancing it with its function and what it what it is actually doing. Um, and I think working in this collaborative way also embeds whatever access you're working with further as it informs everyone's processes. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lily. In the meantime, we received a question from the audience. And the question is, we are starting to offer accessible performances as our venue. It would be great to hear your thoughts on how to build trust with new audiences that we hope to reach. Camilla or Giuseppe or Lily, who wishes to answer? Well, I would say that the trust of the audience, especially a blind audience, entails that before simply telling that there is an accessible audio description, you need to approach the community. You have to tell them what you're doing. And 
also why not organize workshops to explain what you're doing where you want to go in in that way you do have then blind audiences at the performances and you see then they might continue coming to 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 the theater and this means uh, that they become a loyal audience and this also means that they develop a sort of critical approach because it's not so that they simply rest satisfied with the fact that there is an audio description and that's it that's good enough no they give extra comments i enjoyed that performance i experienced this i experienced that i disliked the performance altogether uh, that is the next step and i think that it is an incredible achievement Thank you, Giuseppe. Would you like to add something to that, Lily? There is also then another question for you so that you can answer both. Emily asks, uh, would you mind, Lily, talking a bit more about the way by which you support access uh, for neurodivergent people? Well, yeah, of course. I think um, what I'd add, uh, to that about um, building trust with audiences. I think it's also thinking about how you're reaching audiences. For example, is your marketing accessible? Is the way that you're promoting the work, is that accessible? If there's audio description in the work, are you providing like an audio flyer that introduces the work? Um, yeah, thinking about not just what's in it, but the surrounding sort of support for audiences. Um, yeah, yeah. And then, the second question about um, supporting access for neurodivergent people. So I'll talk a little bit about um, how we sort of are looking at it in terms of performance and then also in terms of our practice as an organisation. Um, so for me, I I think there's a lot about um, information um, and what information we're providing for people about the work beforehand. Um, we provide we're creating um we call it like a, a visual story which is a, kind of a, a plain language sort of easy read guide to the work which sort of introduces themes in the work um introduces the characters or or dancers in the work um and it also tells people what to expect from the show um whether there are yeah whether there's going to be really loud moments whether there's going to be um yeah what the lighting is sort of going to be like and in our performances we're also considering um considerations for sort of relaxed performances and whether yeah whether there's a need to create multiple versions of a of a event of a show um whether we have one with reduced sound and lighting um but something that we're doing in all performances that uh, in the new production that we're creating is um having a quiet space available uh and that's something we're sort of uh, specifying to any venue we go to is that there is a separate quiet space available if people need to go there if they want to go there to chill out if they need to go there during the performance um and then making sure that's facilitated um and we're also sort of leaving house lights up throughout the work so people can navigate out of the auditorium um and yeah it and then yeah, in the in our um, organisation, the ways that we support neurodivergent people is often having conversations around what people need, um, how people like to communicate um, in things like meetings. Is this do people like to have notes? Do people like to have an agenda for what they're talking about? For example, I really like to know ahead of time. This is what we're going to be chatting about. This is some context. Um, do I need to prepare anything? Um, yeah, so those are sort of some of the ways that we're, yeah, working with neurodivergent audiences. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope that this was uh, an answer for uh, uh, Emily. And Bethany Clark asked, uh, another question and i kindly ask camilla perhaps uh, or giuseppe to take the floor and bethany asks uh, what are 
the best ways to ensure that the artist, uh, that the vision is translated in a way audiences may perceive with dance and movement. The vision of artists, uh, meaning those on stage. Well, I think the authors actually. Generally, what Giuseppe and I do is to go and uh, experience the performance live that we want to describe or we ask for a video. And then we start uh, speaking to the artist, uh, the author or the choreographer. And that is the start uh, of our work. We address all the issues that relate to the uh, translation of what happens into words. The key points in order to be as adherent as possible to the performance are understanding the origin of the performance, where it started from. If there are visual things that impress me very much and if that resonates with the idea of the artist, we ask whether we can go in depth into that because we would like to create uh, imaginary uh, descriptions as open as possible to those there because in dance, this means making a journey with your own imagination. We should not provide clear cut things that people simply stick to. Uh, we would like to give either uh, um, a rather guidelines to move around in the performance. So we try and understand whether we, we can f do so by speaking with the artist. We try and find an encounter. If we see that we are going di different ways, then we make a step back and make a correction. And if everything resonates well with the artist, we also bring our own vision strongly into the description. Then another fundamental aspect, for instance, is the way by which you name a performance on stage. And we always ask if they do have names, the characters, if we can call them dancers simply, or people, he, she. We ask about the pronoun they would like to use. We ask whether uh, they, there is another context they would like to make reference to because you see in theater um, naming a body uh, uh, and uh, describing it on stage is a different thing uh, normally it is a character but this is not so in dance it is not common that there are characters uh, that are dancers so it is difficult to have one specific name that you can use one specific description so that is the basis of our of our work and we are always uh, uh, as i said working together with giuseppe giuseppe is blind and so i take a number of things for granted because sight facilitates me in uh, looking for some images well giuseppe can tell me if that is uh, right or wrong sometimes the feedback is just the opposite and we also play on that. At the end of the work, there is always a feedback with the artist in order to understand whether the artist agrees or not with our, let's call it, translation. And I don't know whether Giuseppe wishes to add something to what I said. <laughs> Possibly not, or yes. Yes. If I may, I would like to add one thing. It is important to have artists and performers understand the viewpoint of uh, a blind person in order to explain what our work is, because sometimes in the beginning it might be confused, the situation, and we try and uh, make them understand how powerful words can be. Uh, so our work is creating a new dramaturgy and then uh, reconsidering it, uh, taking away as much as you can, because uh, the, what comes uh, 
uh, from the stage should be one thing, uh, uh, but should in a way be replaced also by our words. So we try and uh, explain that first and foremost. And when people understand this, then it is welcome and used also as an engine for a new creative process. That is very interesting. Thank you, Giuseppe. I'm told that we have also Lucy Bennett with us. So, Lucy, I would like to ask uh, Lucy what uh, creative access is at Stopgap, uh, if you want to take the floor, of course. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm not sure if you can hear me. My name's Lucy. I'm a white, non-disabled person. My pronouns are she, her, they, them. I've got a pink t-shirt on and I have dark curly hair tied up in a ponytail. Um, and I'm the co-artistic director of Stop Gap Dance Company. And I've been working with Lily on Lived Fiction, our latest production where we've explored creative access. And what does creative access mean to Stop Gap? Well, as Lily said, we started, we've always explored access for our dancers and our artists. It's been very much core to our vision. And then when the pandemic hit and we started to explore reaching a new audience through digital work, we realized that we needed to up our game with our access with regards to a broader spectrum of people. And I think all the learning that we did in the pandemic through our digital channels and our home practice for our um, disabled community who couldn't access dance classes because we were in lockdown. Um, we realized we didn't want to unlearn that. And so we, we actually paused a lot of creative ideas and decided to go with this very simple idea of having a conversation between inclusive choreography and creative access in our next production, Lived Fiction. And it's been really interesting. Um, We've had to really like break a lot of rules of theatre, which I think is a good thing. But when we got into production week, actually, for Live Fiction, all those kind of rules came back again. And I think we realised the audience are very conditioned to experience dance in a certain way. And so I think for me, creative access is really about, yeah, reinvention, which we've had to do a lot with regards to dance technique and teaching and teacher training. So I think we we are, yeah, it's about reinvention, I think is the short answer for creative access. And like Lily said, we're trying to make one show that we know will not be perfect and that we know will have lots of clashes with regards to access, but we're also like acknowledging that within the production. And so, yes, we do want to create a relaxed environment, but we also don't want to um, not make it stimulating for people that might want um, bigger noises and louder music. So we're trying to find that balance where we can keep the house lights on and make um, content warnings within the production and enable people to leave the theatre and feel like they can leave the theatre. Um, and then we've been looking at lots of different approaches for audio description. And then we've worked with this amazing captioner create, creating these wonderful creative captions where the words are actually choreographed. And it's been really interesting listening to Giuseppe um, speak about the power of words and um, the fact that the words being captioned creatively is also then really helping that kind of channel for our deaf audiences as well. So, um, yeah, it's been a huge learning curve, live fiction, but I think for Stopgap, it's really about reinventing things. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. There is another question, which is interesting. What is the cost in terms of money for an organization to offer audio description, the sub packs and involving and engaging a neurodivergent public audience? Sorry. So I don't know how it works in the UK, but in Italy, we are doing our best to make institutions and also the Italian parliament understand 
that uh, accessibility, of course, has a cost, an extra cost, when compared to uh, the basic uh, creative process, because in addition to the cost of the description or the subtext or the communication, when you work with artists with disabilities, you need uh, to uh, consider that this might entail extra costs in reaching, for instance, the place, uh, transport, or having uh, uh, someone accompanying the person, an accessible uh, location, and uh, uh, of course, an accessible hotel, and so on and so forth. Sometimes uh, people do not realize that when uh, they uh, establish uh, costs, but th that should be uh, considered. So, uh, Lily and Lucy, could you tell us a bit about the UK scenario? Uh, Lucy speaking. So, um, yes, it is expensive, but I think Stockgap really tries to not go on about that actually and talk a lot about money um, because it's very much part of what we do. We have, like Lily said, it's a collective responsibility. And so therefore it's part of our identity in Stockgap. Access is very much part of our identity. So we tend not to talk about it a lot. And it's one of the reasons why Lily's role has developed as an access artist so that we can start to do things more in house. Um, this obviously saves money in a way by creating a role that's within the company, but we were quite nervous touring sometimes we would ask for access and a lot of promises would be made and then they just people just didn't have capacity so we felt we needed to take um take responsibility for our audiences really and um, make sure that we provided the access so that we could generate that kind of diverse audience that we really really want to um have experiencing um there are lots of things to support with um access it's always in the budget um and we can apply for access to work in the uk to support um part-time and full-time uh artists or people that are employed by the company so we can um they can have people to go with them to work to support with um accessing work basically you know travel organization captions sign interpretation all of that stuff can be provided for if we employ our artists um, it's it's really hard for me to put a, a number or a, a budget on things because I am the artistic director as opposed to the producer so um, but you can always get in contact with Stockgap if you need a bit more support in finding out specifics Thank you very much, Lucy. In Italy, we lag a bit, lag behind a bit. In our works, uh, and by saying our works, I mean uh, the artists of Aldiqua artists. Uh, um, of course, uh, also would like to focus on accessibility. And when we uh, uh, focus on accessibility at festivals, at venues, uh, uh, we always uh, need to ask who pays for the extra costs. Is it the artist? Is it the theater hosting the performance? Is it the government? We are still reasoning on those aspects, but I'm sure that we will find a way. So unless there are further questions uh, from the audience, uh, I would like uh, to go back uh, to uh, Giuseppe and Camilla and ask them whether they are willing to share with us one or several practical examples of uh, audio descriptions for dance so that we move from theory to practice in a way so would you please provide us with examples giuseppe and camilla well there are different ways of audio descriptions with works with in recent years. We do not take for granted that audio description is needed. So we uh, 
start from the assumption that the uh, performance is acceptable, accessible uh, to uh, deaf and blind people. And then we consider whether the description is needed or not. You ask, for example, so there was one performance where we made a description in the I person. The performance is Alexis 2.0 by Aristide Rontini. And it was based on a book written as a diary. On stage, there is one performer alone. And that is the I person of the diary. So we decided we would write the audio description using the I pronoun. My voice uh, spoke using the he pronoun describing the physical perception of the person on stage. For instance, if the performer um, uh, would uh, touch uh, the thighs, uh, with the hands, instead of simply describing the movement, the physical movement that people would see, we use metaphors such as, uh, I can feel that my uh, hands are warm on my legs. Uh, uh, so we were trying to provide tactile experiences um, referred to the performer in the eye person. That was one example. Then there is another example that I can mention one performance that had a specific structure and was based on improvisation for two hours and a half, actually. And we decided, after speaking at length with the artist, to uh, experience the same status and condition of the artist on stage. So we decided, Giuseppe and I, to improvise in relation to what happened around us. People were allowed to walk around in space, cross the space, be close to the performance, sit down, fall asleep. So the performance uh, was made of everyone there. We were all part of the performance. And the description in that case took as reference all the people in, in the area, in the space. And you, it took some time, of course, um, after uh, bringing the person into the space and starting this process, you couldn't tell the difference between audience and performers. Uh, and we also gave the audio description to sighted people. So it was fun for them uh, because uh, they were described and they could hear the description or a description of their position, or they were asking themselves whether we were describing them or not, or other people. So it was a sort of play of game that started that made it possible for both uh, sighted and blind uh, people to be part of the work, part of the performance. We've worked with the artist a lot with that because we understood that it was interesting also for sighted people. There is no longer a description for uh, the blind. It was not exclusively accessibility work. It was an artistic work, which also included accessibility uh, for, uh, uh, for blind people. So these are, these are the uh, two examples that have come to my mind. Giuseppe, would you like to add something? Well, the work then evolved, it is called the Tristas, and uh, Camilla and the choreographer are on stage and the audio described for everyone so much so that the audio description has become a value added for the performance itself. And the performance on stage is influenced by the audience, by the situation, by the place, by the lights, by the sounds, the noise the music and also by the description of uh, her, of the environment, of the audience. <coughs> so we moved from a performance where the performer was the very center of everything in dancing, when dancing, to the same thing but enhanced by the description, amplified by the description. Everything can be described. 
Camilla and Marta, the choreographer, have their own rules. They have given themselves specific tasks that they let um, everything which happens on stage come to them without giving an objective description, as if they were simply telling what is happening, but starting various layers of imagination. Thank you, Giuseppe. Thank you, Camilla. We have only three minutes left. So, Bethany asks whether <coughs> in the UK there are schools or ways where you can learn to be an access artist. I don't know whether Lucy or Lily can answer. Can you give a piece of advice to Bethany? Um, yeah, uh, I don't know if schools exist <laughs> about them, um, but there are a lot of companies, for example, um, that offer training around uh, things like audio description. One of them who I trained with are a great organization called Quiplash. Um, they offer uh, training in audio description, particularly creative audio description. Um, but I think being around a lot of deaf, disabled neurodivergent people, you learn a lot about different ways to access work. Um, and something I think we're really keen on is collaborating and having consultants come in um, who have a varying amount of lived experience. So um, they can sort of, uh, we, we learn from them and yeah, they can test out what access um, we're working with and trial it. Um, and I think, sometimes people think access is something you have to go somewhere and learn about um, before you can just give it a go. But there are a lot of things that you can just sort of try. For example, a small example, if you are creating something on social media, um, thinking about providing an image description for people um, who are blind or visually impaired that describes your image, just this sort of small simple steps around um inclusive accessible practice that you can yeah start incorporating into your into your work and into into what you're doing every day um yeah um and i mean there's a lot of great inclusive organizations around as well um yeah i, d I don't know if that's answered <laughs> answer the question but <laughs> We are closing, but there is a final question from Aya about uh, the reference of uh, the latest re performance that Camilla and Giuseppe talked about. Trespass should be the title. Camilla, Giuseppe, am I right? Yes, Trespass, uh, Tales of Unexpected. And uh, that is the subtitle, so to say, that makes it uh, distinguishable from the original work without the description. It will be in Sardinia, Sassari, on uh, the 11th of June. That is the debut. And then we will have uh, further and additional dates in April, in April 2024. Marta Olivieri is the name of the choreographer. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will write information in the chat. I would like to thank you all, really, wholeheartedly for this wonderful webinar. If you wanted to have additional information and know more about the next appointment, so please visit the um, website uh, of Stop Gap or um, follow Stop Gap on social media. Thank you. Thanks to you all and enjoy the evening. <laughs>